number four. This happened when I was 10. It was the summer of 2008 and my mum and I decided to go to Disney World for a mini vacation. It was a long, tiring drive and we finally got to Orlando after about five hours. It was super late and we were trying to find a decent hotel to crash in for a few nights. After looking for a long hour, we finally found a hotel that wasn't booked to the rim. This hotel was really gorgeous and not to mention really big. There were enough mesmerizing lights in the building to blind a person. We parked and brought our luggage in ourselves since we didn't have much and we walked in. Amazingly, it was even more beautiful on the inside. It was decorated very nicely with a smooth velvety wall and a smooth marble floor. The lady at the front desk, she was really nice too and she found us a room. She told us our room was on the 10th floor and then she called one of the hotel servants to escort us to our room. When he came over to us, he just silently stood there. He didn't even say hello or anything. And me, being the observant kid I was, I began to study him. He was a very tall, dark-skinned man, about 6'2", and he wore very small, oval-shaped glasses. They were so small though that they didn't even cover his eyes completely. He also had a very scruffy, unshaven face, and he smelled putrid, like he'd been submerged in a garbage can or something. It was very hard for me not to contort my face as he just silently stood there, the odour filling up my nostrils. He abruptly turned around, heading towards the elevator, and I guess that was his way of telling us to come on, so we followed. Being in the elevator with him was the creepiest thing ever. The entire way up to our room, he just stood there, back against the wall of the elevator, staring ahead, the entire time. He just didn't even move. It was like standing next to a statue or something. My mum was as creeped as I was, and we kept exchanging confused glances. We finally arrived on our floor, and I was so weirded out, I wanted to practically run out of the elevator. So, anyways, he walked us into our room, and we put our stuff down, exhausted. The hotel servant, instead of leaving the room, he just stood there, staring at us. After about two minutes, he just slowly turned around and then just left. The way he moved was almost robot-like, and he closed the door gently behind him and left. My mum and I just looked at each other, bewildered. What in the heck was wrong with this man, I thought to myself. But I tried not to worry too much about it. I mean, after all, we were on vacation. About 45 minutes later, my mum called room service because her bed didn't have a mattress and they said that they would send someone up as soon as possible. Five minutes later, there was a knock on the door. My very tired mum, she got up and answered the door when all of a sudden, she jumped back when she saw who it was. It was him, again. He slowly pushed the mattress into the room, put it against the wall and left. My mum and I gave each other a weird look again, and I helped her put the mattress on her bed. We both got comfortable, and eventually, we fell asleep. I woke up two hours later feeling unsettled, like something just didn't feel right. I turned over, and once my eyes adjusted to the darkness, my blood ran cold. There stood the man, standing over my mum, just staring at her while she was sleeping. How the hell did he even get in here? I thought to myself. I screamed so loud, I was sure I woke up everyone in the hotel. My screaming woke up my mum, and she bolted over to my bed, eyes wide. After I screamed, he looked at us, slowly turned around, and left. I frantically grabbed my phone and called the police. It took them about an hour to get to us, but when they finally got here, they got to our room and they told us that they found the man hiding in one of the laundry rooms on a different floor, and they also said that he had a knife hidden under his shirt. What the police officer told us after this really freaked me out even more than the fact that he had a knife. It turns out that this guy, he was a registered sex offender. The next morning, we went to a different hotel. We knew the man was in custody, but we just couldn't stay in that room knowing what happened. I'm so glad that my mum wasn't hurt, and I just don't want to think about what would have happened if he pulled out that knife. Number three. 
so. This happened during the summer, about July to be exact. I'm a 17 year old female, and I weigh roughly 120 pounds, which will be relevant later. I'm from Ukraine, so I've seen my fair share of people that are just downright fucking crazy. But this one sticks out, since as much as I've travelled, I've never had anything like it happen to me. Anyway, I was taking a vacation with my friend and her families in Constanta, Romania, which is a fairly nice city with nice people, but you do get the occasional drug addict. So, the second day we were there, her parents gave us money to go and buy something or to do something. We decided to get some lunch and then head to the nearest music store, as both my friend and I are into music and a lot of death metal. We found a nice restaurant with reasonable prices. We took a seat outside and ordered our food. I'm multilingual and speak Romanian amongst many other languages, while my friend only speaks English, which means I had to translate. After we ordered our food, we started talking about a new death metal band that she had found. It was called Cerebral Bore. Now, I'm usually on high alert of everything around me and how people are acting as I've watched too many shows to be completely oblivious of my surroundings. So as I'm listening to my friend talk, I see this dude a few tables away, eyeing us pretty intently, almost as if he were trying to listen in on our conversation or something, but couldn't understand English. It wasn't too sketchy yet, but I did get a creepy vibe from him. A few minutes later, we have our food, and as my friend is still ranting about one of her favourite bands breaking up, that sketchy guy, sitting a little ways from us, walks over and sits down, right fucking next to my friend. Not just casually next to her, I'm talking right next to her, where their chairs are practically touching. Of course, both of us just stare at each other, and mouth, what the fuck, to each other. That's when he starts talking to her, speaking in Romanian. She looks to me to translate for him, but I'm almost too afraid to, as the things he was saying they were so sexually explicit and violent that I wouldn't want to even repeat it. Alarms are going off in my head, and there isn't really anyone around to witness this, so I start to pack up my things, telling my friend to do the same. As we get up to leave, he grabs her wrist, causing her to jump a little. He starts mumbling too, still thinking she spoke Romanian, I guess. He was telling her to stay, and calling her baby, and other creepy pet names. At this point, I'm starting to get a little irritated, so I tell this guy that she doesn't speak Romanian and that we have to go. He backs off. For now. About an hour later, we're walking down the road when we notice a car slowly following us. Since I notice it first, I see that it's the same man from the restaurant. I don't want to scare my friend, but there's no way around this now. I start telling her to walk faster, trying to get to the nearest shop or busy part of town. I knew that if he tried anything, I couldn't exactly take him, as I'm way too small and this guy has a good foot or so on me. As we're walking, I see the car shop and the man gets out, but this time, he's got a gun. Now, while my friend isn't fully aware of what's happening, I keep mumbling to myself, shit, shit. This guy starts screaming at my friend and I, telling her to come over to him, and even though I said to this guy that she doesn't speak Romanian, he's still trying to talk to her. She starts screaming at me over his screaming, asking me what he wants, and I'm screaming over her screaming over him to try and tell her what's going on. The whole thing was chaos for a good 10 minutes, since everyone is screaming, and this asshole is waving his gun at her. The whole thing goes on for a good 15 minutes before he gets in her face and demands for her to get in the car with him. He put the gun to her chest, and I was sure that we were both about to die at this point. But out of some miracle, these two cop cars drive up, lights flashing. They immediately get out and wrestle this crazy guy down to the ground and put him in handcuffs. As they're stuffing him into the car, he's screaming at us, saying that he'll find us and rape each of us while the other watches. One of the cops asked us what the hell was going on, and I start explaining that this guy was stalking my friend and I, and how he kept trying to force her to go with him. In the meantime, the other cop is talking to him, and he's yelling back at the guy over and over before slamming the door shut. 
He comes back over to us and explains that this man had apparently mistaken my friend for his ex-girlfriend, who also apparently just up and left him in pretty bad shape financially and mentally, and he really wanted to kill her. I don't know who called the cops or why they happened to be driving by that day, but I could not be more grateful to those officers for arresting this crazy asshole and then being nice enough to buy me and my friend a bus ticket back to our hotel. Number 2 A few years ago, five friends or co-workers I had were headed to Florida for a much needed vacation from work. We had decided before the trip that we would all take turns driving because it was to be a 12 hour journey and nobody wanted to drive more than a few hours. My friend Miguel volunteered to take the first shift and I volunteered to stay up with him for his first shift. We ended up driving most of the way like this because I think Miguel was a little nervous about letting anyone else drive. He was the only guy on this trip and is a firm believer that guys are superior drivers to girls. Yeah, I know. I don't always agree with what he thinks, but I went along with it because I really wasn't that tired, and I don't think anyone else really wanted to drive through the night anyway. Everything was going just fine, and the rest of our friends had fallen asleep around 11 or 12, but Miguel and I were keeping ourselves awake with 5 hour energies of deep conversations about the existence of life as we know it. We would occasionally sing songs as they came on the radio too. After about 6 or 7 hours of driving without a break, we decided that we should probably stop at a gas station to switch drivers, and so that people could get snacks and relieve themselves. At this point, it was around 3 or 4 in the morning, and people were really aching to stretch their legs. Miguel and I, we saw that there was a gas station at the next exit, so we took it. But there seemed to be nothing once we left the interstate. There were a few shady buildings with inadequate lighting, and a seemingly endless field of some sort all around us. We had to pull out the GPS system to help us find the gas station that was supposedly off this exit. We discovered quickly that we needed to travel a few miles into the nearest town to get to it, and immediately regretted the decision to stop at this particular exit. But we were already off the road, so we figured we might as well find this gas station. There was pretty much nothing there. I come from a town of about 1500 people, so I'm pretty accustomed to secluded areas, but this it was just creepy. The only lights around were the ones from the company van my grandfather loaned us for the trip. We eventually reached a heavily wooded section, and that definitely added to the creepiness factor. The rest of our friends were awake at this point, trying to help us to spot the gas station, and a few minutes later, we finally spotted the familiar glow of a marathon gas station ahead. There were no other cars there. We parked the car at the pump so that we could refill while we took care of our other business. As soon as we opened the car door, we noticed an overwhelming smell of bacon wafting through the air. It really did smell delicious and was making us all very hungry. A few of us commented on how strange it was for a gas station attendant to be making bacon at such an odd hour, but we left it at that. It wasn't until we opened the doors to the convenience market that Miguel and I noticed that it was blocked off by wooden pallets. There were also two people in the store that had to have known that we were there, but they just ignored us completely. They acted as if they didn't want to be seen. We thought that was strange and immediately began looking for another entrance. We probably should have left as soon as we discovered this, but we summed it up as the doors being broken and they just hadn't fixed it yet. We walked around the building to find a second door at the back and keep in mind that this station was in a heavily wooded area. There were trees surrounding it on the back two sides of the store. I remember how creepy it was back there, with only one light placed crookedly over the single door at the back of the store. Initially, I was nervous to enter the back of the store, but I had to use the restroom so bad that I let Miguel try the handle. It was locked. Unfortunately, this meant that I probably would have to hold it in, until at least we found a new exit, or I would have to go into the woods. It then dawned on me how sketchy this situation actually was. A 24 hour gas station that was blocked off to all customers was not something you saw every day. This prompted Miguel and I to hastily make our way the rest of the way around the store and back to the van. As we rounded the last corner, 
we saw that there was a window next to the cash register that had been busted in. We could clearly see people in the store, but they acted like they didn't want us to be there, and they just stared at us with looks that I later determined to be looks of fright, almost like they were up to something they shouldn't have been. Miguel and I began to jog after this, and we went as fast as we could through the long wet grass to the van. At this point, we hear loud footsteps behind us that immediately made us jump and move faster. As we're running, I hear a familiar voice. Guys, why are you running? Good, it's just my friend Rue, I thought. Rue, hurry up back to the van. We gotta get out of here, let's go. I heard Miguel say in a hushed tone. There was a look of confusion on Rue's face, but then she noticed the broken window. We made it back into the van and started pulling out of the parking lot when we saw two cop cars pull into the station. I made eye contact with the cops in the car and I was sure that they were going to stop us for some reason. All of us were completely silent as we sit and wait for what is sure to happen. But to my surprise, the cops let us go without making us stop or even roll down the window to ask if we know what's going on. We hightailed it out of there so fast that we made it back to the interstate in record time. On our way back home from vacation, we decided to look up that gas station to see if there'd been any criminal activity on that night. We discovered that there had been two robberies, less than an hour from each other. During the first robbery, the thieves stole an ATM that was in the store. It kind of sounded like a professional job because the whole ordeal took less than three minutes to accomplish. The second robbery was a theft from the cash register, and neither robbery seemed to be connected. It was very strange that they would occur at the same gas station so close in time to one another. I keep wondering if those guys in the store were actually the thieves, or if they were just attendants fearing another attack. By the looks on their faces, I've come to the conclusion that they must have been the attendants. I also can't figure out why the whole place reeked of bacon. I guess I'll always wonder these things, and I dread to think about what could have happened to us if we got there earlier or even if we stayed any longer. Let's just say that nobody was really tired after that, and Miguel was more than willing to finish the trip in the driver's seat. Number 1 The dreaded family vacation. You know, up to a certain age, there is a comfort, and excitement even, about being cooped up with your nearest and dearest in a tin can on wheels for a week or two at a time. But once you reach the age of independent thinking, those family camping trips can seem more like punishment for some unknown crime. In my case, I made this realization about the age of 12. Unfortunately, this was too young to make a case for staying home while the rest of the folks went traping up and down the east coast, hitting all the historical landmarks worth seeing, and a whole lot more of them that just should have been left out of the Rand McNally Atlas. That was how we found our way before Google and GPS. Some trips, however, did not take us too far from home, and these were more tolerable. Mainly because the shorter distance somehow meant we had more room for stuff. I still can't reconcile that math, but it meant that I could take my bike with me, and that meant that I could escape the campsite and get off by myself to explore. Woods, lake shores, trails, I rode them all. All on that old Schwinn, with the hard rubber tires and only one gear. We were camping in southern New Jersey, in the area known as the Pine Barrens. This name might be familiar to anyone that has run across the stories of the Jersey Devil, or those mafia hitmen who left their victims there. The Barrens are a unique ecosystem, with miles and miles of scrub pine, white sand roads, and amazingly, given most people's impression of New Jersey, a whole lot of nothing else. I had started out on the main road, but took a side branching trail, and soon was deep in the woods. It was tricky going, as the sand trail often got deep and soft, and I would need to weave between these spots to stay upright. Occasionally, there was nothing else to do but dismount and push the bike through firmer area. After about 20 minutes of this, I came across one of the small, shallow streams that laced the barrens. The trail descended to the stream, then rose just a bit on the other side. Neither bank was that steep. In fact, if I stood in the stream, I'd be able to see over either bank into the trees that came up just to the edges. I got off the bike as the trail was narrow and I had the vague idea of fording the stream while carrying the bike. 
Concentrating on keeping my footing while I descended, I was frozen in my tracks with the most hideous screeching scream. It was a cross between a wail and a cackle, and it was loud, really loud. It came from straight up, and there, perched on the branches, was something. Remember, I'm 12, pushing a bike and scared so shitless that I would not need to potty stop for two days. I saw claw-like feet grasping the branch with bent skinny legs and a furry body leaning forward a bit and two red eyes. I am tempted to say glowing red eyes, but I can't swear by the glow. Red, however, is definite. There were humpy shapes behind the body that might spread out into wings, but I didn't stop to wait for an air show. I threw my leg over my bike, hit the pedals, and flew down the near bank, through the stream and up on the other side. I was pedaling for gold at that point, and did not slow down until I met up with the main road, maybe 15 minutes from that stream. When I say main road, I mean something wide enough for a car, that is, one car. At that point, I slowed down enough to risk a backward glance, and nothing. I let the bike coast to a stop and wearily climbed off, realizing, as I did, that somewhere in my wild ride, I'd torn open my arm. The blood was running freely from a long deep scratch. Blood, even mine, does not bother me much. Pain, on the other hand, it sucks. And this sucker was starting to hurt. I remembered some fundamental first aid, and I tried to tear some material from my shirt to use as a bandage. T-shirts, they were tougher than 12 year olds back then, so I had no luck. As I stood, debating my options, I glanced back the way I came, and thought that I saw a dark figure either leaping or flying along the trail I'd just covered. Fuck the first aid. I bolted. I was never an athletic kid, but I could have set some kind of land speed record that morning. Honestly, I have never before or since moved that fast. The road was blessedly firm, and I didn't wipe out on soft sand. The turn off to the campground was just ahead, and I kept telling myself, believing I had circled around and was now coming into the grounds from the back, but there was no signs, no entrance, no side roads, just this single ribbon of sand stretching ahead forever. So I pedaled, glancing back every now and then, nothing behind and damn little ahead. Just at that point, where I'd convinced myself that I had really screwed up and gotten myself lost in the woods forever, I saw a signpost in the distance. Riding more slowly now, I finally reached it and discovered I was only about half a mile from the campground. The ground around the sign was disturbed, and something glittery caught my eye. It was a bottle, well, half a bottle, with a beautiful, sharp edge. Bottle in hand, I attacked my t-shirt and soon had the lower half of my arm well wrapped. Now, I could finally think. I stood with one hand on the bike and peered back the way I had come, and nothing. I held my breath, trying to listen, and nothing. I got back on the bike and proceeded at a slow pedal for the rest of the way. As I turned into the campground entrance, I relaxed, really feeling as though I had reached home base and safety. But that's when it swooped, passing just a few feet over my head and it let out one last banshee cackle. Don't ask me why I still had that broken bottle in the basket of my bike, or why I whipped it out and flung it upward as hard as I could. I missed, of course, but the creature went away, and honestly, that's all I cared about. Naturally, all the grown-ups were concerned about the arm wound, and I fluffed through the explanation of falling down a bank and cutting it somehow. The details of the encounter, they weren't worth mentioning. The lecture about bike safety would have been bad enough without adding warnings about flying hairy creatures into the mix. A registered nurse with whom we were camping with took over. She cleaned and rewrapped my arm and decided I probably didn't need stitches. In the end, she was right. I still have that arm and the scar to remind me of that experience. As to whatever it was that I met that day, well, that area does encompass a bird sanctuary and there are a number of large, loud birds that either lived there or stopped in as they migrated. Sure, it could have been a bird, a hairy bird with red eyes. I mean, there's lots of them around, aren't there?
G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video guys. You know, I once heard this story that was similar to the one about the gas station robbery, except the guys were dressed in Energizer bunny suits and they were charged with battery. <laughs> Get it? Charged with battery, Energizer batteries. Oh man, I'm really not ending the year on a strong note, am I guys? Ah oh, well, <laughs> that's the best I got today, so <laughs> you're just going to have to live with it. <laughs> Uh, thanks again to the Hive members that bravely shared their story for us all here, and I really hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, for the chance to have your story feature in a video, you can send your story to my email which is in the description below. And as always, keep them coming guys, as this channel relies upon your stories to continue. Also guys, please do me a favour and just state in your email what your story is about in the description, and also provide me with a short written statement of consent, just so that I can be above board with everything. Also, please remember to tell me in the email if you would like to remain anonymous, and please change any names if you don't want particular names to be shared. Also guys, just to let you know, I will be taking Christmas Eve, uh, Christmas Day and Boxing Day off this year to spend some time with some family, so I won't have any vids up during this time. But I'm also working on a mega stories vid of the number ones of this year so far for the end of this week. Now, the stories in the video won't have any pics or sound effects, uh, it will just be the recordings for the year. Uh, the reason for this is that it will probably be about 6 hours long, which is freaking huge. And uh, it would take me forever to put all of the sound effects and pictures and everything in the video of that size. So instead of this, as a bit of an end of year bonus, I thought I would just get together all of the number ones for 2015 and kind of just place them in a mega video for you guys to kick back and listen to and share with family and friends over the Christmas break. So yeah, um, stay tuned for that as there will be something at the end of the week, but yeah, I will be taking a little bit of a break. Uh, as always guys, it would be awesome if you could like, share, comment and subscribe if you're new. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for updates throughout the week. You can also catch me on my second gaming channel, all of which have links in the description below. Also guys, if you have any topic suggestions for videos, make sure to drop that down below as well. Uh, thanks again for always tuning in guys and for all of the support and as always, I'll see you mates in the next one.